Um, all right, I think Martin already gave a very good introduction of the intake of the material, the processing of the material. What we're going to talk about now is really what we did with the output of that material and what's possible with that. And maybe also what's not possible today, but might be possible in the future. Good. So if I list the overall objectives as they were defined in the project, you will see, and this is what Martin talked about, demonstrate the use of multi-cycle for post-industrial and post-consumer flexible packaging waste. We saw that we were able to recover resins that look very much like what you get from a resin supplier. Second point was to characterize the properties, processability of those materials recovered. There, uh, Centex Bell also as a partner in some of the earlier public dissemination events already talked about that at length. Um, and to compare that then with what's being used today from the virgin uh, resin uh, manufacturing industry for flexible packaging, if you would be able to apply that for home and personal care type of applications, especially because that question actually is very relevant around EFSA. Um, today, that would be the prime market where this type of material would be uh, a good fit. What I will focus on more now is, can we produce small series of prototypes of flexible packaging formats? containing a significant percent of uh, post-industrial or post-consumer waste, which would also meet industrial requirements. Because in the end, you can make something that's so low in quality that if you would run it on an industrial line, you would be more, uh, more stopped than go. And finally, also to perform it at larger pilot scale. Let's see. We're playing the same. Yeah. Oh. Next one, yeah, exactly. Just to um, recapitulate on what Martin has told, so we both had post-industrial waste, which was shown this uh, PA, uh, PET type of material. We had uh, tailor-made post-industrial as well from uh, primarily polypropylene. And then we had this 323 uh, fraction from the German uh, flexible post-consumer uh, mix. What was recovered was this polyamide, polypropylene post-industrial, polypropylene post-consumer, and polyethylene post-consumer. Good, I think, oh, yeah. Next slide, please. All right, so how exactly now did we qualify this resin? Because this actually, there's not really a validated way that it's done in the industry today. So we sort of came up in the consortium with a protocol that would allow us to assess if it's suitable for packaging solutions, yes or no. And the first one, it's quite an important one, and Martin already touched upon it briefly. When you reprocess polymers from uh, wastes, there tend to be a lot of side products. And those side products, they can be harmless, they can just give you some not so nice smells, but they can also be degradation products from some of the inks, some of the adhesives, some of the byproducts, which actually might then migrate into the packaged good that you're doing, but as well might um, fumigate when you re-extrude it into a film and be a, a processing hazard for your processing operators. So first step that we did in collaboration with the Fraunhofer Institute was to see, okay, is the product that we generate safe to process on our lines? And the answer there was positive. We had a limit that was higher than at four milligrams, but it was confirmed that everything that was in there was actually non uh, hazardous uh, at the PPM levels that they were there. As we got the green light to process it on our uh, lab extrusion line, so this is a, a Dr. Colin Blown uh, lab line, uh, typically you will generate something like a 20 centimeter wide roll, and I can show you here, this is some of the typical material that you will generate out of that. So that's typically a blown film, and you can see you might have some minor gels and specs in there, you see that the color is a bit transferred into the film. That being said, we always start with a 100% virgin resin as a reference, because every machine behaves differently. I'm here in Ghent, for example, we have 10 industrial uh, blowing lines. Each of those lines, you need to slightly change the recipes that you run simply because machine is uh, configured in a slightly different way. 100% as reference, then a 50-50% reference with the Kreosov material first to see, okay, are we able to process this? Can we get a stable bubble? Do we have stable pressure? Um, do we see that we can collect something that's looking quite smooth? It's not wrinkling up, it's processing well. If that's the case, then finally we switch to 100% PCR material. 
If you look at the reference in the market today, this 100% step, half of the time it will not work. The fact here that you are able to do it, to pr produce a 100% pure PCR film, is an indication already of the quality. If you then further look at the feedback that we get from the process, very important is pressure levels and pressure buildup. You take in a material that's a mix of everything together, so the resin that you generate will be an average of all those different polyethylene or polypropylene resins that you take there together. If the MFI, the melt flow index, is too low, basically the pressure in the extruder will be too high and you will not be able to process. This one actually fell quite nicely in 0 0.8 to 1.5, depending on which source that was used. So that was fine. And also we had a stable pressure profile, which means that whatever impurities that you have there that you catch with your filtration systems, it's not hampering the extrusion blow process itself. Bubble stability, we had a very stable, continuous bubble, also a uh, good indication of quality. And then we also look at color, smell, and visible gels, because the moment you blow that film, it's actually a very good point in time to see if you have a lot of gels, yes or no. And I think if you look, you probably can see that there's some minor specks in there, but overall the quality is actually quite good. Smell, you will have some smell, that's for sure, there's still transfer of smell. And that probably is something that for the future you would need to tackle with dealing with more pre-treatment options because there's a lot of also organic waste that tends to transfer smell into your product. And then we went lab analytical on this, you know, lab line film to see, okay, what's the tensile properties, what's puncture, um, how tough is that material, how easily does it tear. And this basically is a guideline if you then take it into a coax film production, so a multi-layer monomaterial type of film, how much of that creosol material can you put in without moving away from the industrial standards that are expected by your customers. Also important, haze levels, which is uh, critical for printability. Uh, Silap, it's your discoloration. How much uh, is it deviating from a purely transparent virgin film? Seal initiation, why is that important? Because as you start moving more and more from multi-material into monomaterial solutions, you need a certain seal window between the outer layer of the film and the seal layer of the film. If that window is not there as you seal your packaging together, you will basically create sticking issues with your seal jars, you will have deformation. So that's important to know where can we implement this resin. And then finally also DSC to understand, okay, how much impurities are also transferred into the final film itself. Good, so the first one, the post-industrial um, polyamide. Uh, we were able to cast film extrude that into two different thicknesses. You can see there is a clear color transfer, which is this mix of blue and green. So the color is being transferred. If you look at the mechanical properties of the film as such, we see that tensile properties elongation slightly decreased as we increase the recycled content into our uh, PA film but not to that extent that it was really problematic. If you then afterwards, we also stretched out that film, which I would say is probably one of the most challenging things that you can do to such uh, a blown film. We did a three by three ratio initially with 30% creosol material in the film, and we were able to stretch it without tearing it, which indicates also that whatever impurity that you have in there is not harmful enough to basically uh, damage or deteriorate the performance of that film. The green hue, so the color that you see here, is also transferred into that stretched films. And you can see this is one of the mock-ups that we made with that uh, PA film. If you look closely, you will see that there's a slight greenish background on the white, which as a non-expert probably you wouldn't pick up on. If you hold it to a virgin film, you will see there's a slight shift in color. And I do invite everybody that's here in person to come and have a look, or you can have it pass around uh, to, to just have, uh, have a look and see. These are some of the mock-ups that were made in the lab, so they are not up to, I would say, actual industrial standards, but they give a very good indication of what's possible with that film. If we then go to the polypropylene, 
There we really looked at this uh, DKR323-2 fraction. The fact that you have this many fractions also, it's again an indication of how complex this uh, waste industry is. We have that material recovered as a, as a resin. We cast film extruded it. You can see here, this is your virgin reference, and then you have your 50% uh, and 100%. Um, overall, we see there's a bit of a reduction in puncture resistance compared to a standard resin used for cast film extrusion. Not surprising because a lot of the PP that you recover from this will be used for making stretched film. And stretched film typically is less tough, it's more stiff, slightly more brittle, so it's not a surprise that you have this reduction in puncture, but you see indeed an increased stiffness, similar tear, similar tensile properties. Again, haze increased, we see gels present there, and there is also this smell transfer, very similar to the OPA. Orientation did work very well, and we were able to stretch it down to four micron film, really challenging. As well as with the thicker films, we were able to stretch seven times, which is more or less the industrial standard uh, today. And I actually have one of these films here, which you can see. This film is basically what you get from uh, that nice greenish looking film there. So it's, it shows you it's actually up to the level of what you would expect. And as you down gauge it, also that color difference that you have between virgin and uh, creosote material, it disappears more or less completely. We haven't had the time yet to make the full mock-ups of this one, but feel free afterwards to come and have a look at the films themselves. Next one, polyethylene, same source, but uh, recovery of the PE fraction, very similar look. So it's important to realize that the pigmentation that you have in your films, it's not transferred into a single material fraction, it's actually distributed quite evenly. And that also has to do with the fact of how you build up your structures and different companies using different strategies. So your ink, it can be on your polyprop site, it can be on your polyethylene site, and it, it ends up in the final process. Important is if you look, their resistance actually improved to a standard LDPE, no impact on puncture, slightly reduced stiffness, more elastic, as a balance, similar tensile properties. Again, increased haze, gels are present. We have that smell, um, and we, sh as Martin showed, there's a minor presence of polypropylene in there, but not to an extent that it was really impacting the overall performance. Very important to realize is if we looked at the sealing behavior of this polyethylene, it was very different from a standard uh, sealing PE film. So a sealing PE film, typically 80 degrees, 90 degrees Celsius, it will start sticking to one another. Here we were closer to this 120 degrees C, so a, a gap of 40 degrees. And if you think about it, because it's a mix of PEs, it's actually not that surprising. You put in LDPE, LLDPE, HDPE, and that mix, actually that will be just the average uh, sealing temperature that you will generate from that. Also important, we did an oxygen uh, transfer uh, test, so OTR, transmission rate, and actually it was very similar, also showing that whatever minor foreign components you have in there, they're not impacting the barrier performance of the product. Good, so this is an overview of all the demonstrators that we committed to in the project. A number of them are here. A number of them are also being finalized. So for example, the polypropylene, the coax structure is being made third week of April, um, actually because we ran into a raw material shortage in polypropylene in the pilot. So it's, it's showing again that the importance of having alternative streams of raw materials available to cope with very volatile markets. Um, so you will see everything is focused on the home and personal care markets. So flow wraps, such as stand-up pouches, um, lotion samples, and every time we try to implement it somewhere in the structure, and I will go over it. In general, we go from somewhere as low as 3% because it's in the stretched film, so a very minor component of the overall laminate, but 30% in the stretched film, so considerable in that sense, up to 85% in the total laminate structure. So really something that has an impact on the final product performance. <laughs> One back. All right, so if I take the first demonstrator that we have, and I will also let it go around in the market, it's this one. 
It's actually a typical flow wrap product for wet wipes. Uh, if you look at the composition, pat on the outside there for stiffness. Heat resistance means if you seal, it doesn't stick while your PE starts melting. Transparency, which you need if you print in reverse. And it's also very printable. The EVOH we have in there, that's mainly there for the chemical resistance. Because wet wipes for home care products, they contain chemical agents for cleaning. Um, and these tend to interact with the packaging itself. The EVOH acts as a barrier that prevents migration um, inside out so that your printing design is not uh, starting to, uh, to deform. The PE in there, it's offering you moisture barrier. So if it's wet, that basically it's not drying out. Sealability, as we discussed before, toughness, if you drop it, that the pack is not jumping open, and also the general mechanical properties. Why did we put the polyethylene in the middle? Again, because of the sealability, we want the inner seal layer to be lower. The color, we don't want to show the color because it's impacting the overall customer perception. And because as you have some minor gels in there, if you put it on the outside completely or on the inside completely, those gels might lead to blocking on uh, your blow processing line. Now we'll let it pass around. And here we have about 30% of recycled contents into the packs. Please don't destroy them. I would like to take them home afterwards. <laughs> Good. If we go to the second one, so one slide back, you will see this exact same product. Again, the wet uh, wipe flow wrap. But here we are talking about the recycling ready solution. So it means that we are only using polyolefinic materials. OPP on the outside, PE in the center. The OPP, it's currently used a lot as a pet replacement but it reduces that window of um, operation. So it's a bit more challenging, but with the right processing parameters, you are able to cope. And it's offering you very much the same properties, stiffness, heat resistance, transparency, printability, moisture barrier. And actually that film I just showed you, that transparent four micron film could be a replacement for that one. For this mock-up, we use the virgin one, but you could think of making a structure that's actually entirely built uh, with recycled material in each of the layers. Polyethylene, exactly the same, and also exactly the same reason why we put it in the center of the structure. And you would think, okay, it's actually in the ceiling area, but this bottom layer, it's a coax structure, which means we use different extruders, we bring it together, and you actually have different layers of the same base polymer there, some for toughness, some for sealability, etc. So the overall content is about... 48% of polyethylene in the final pack. And remember, this is the film <laughs> that looked like this when we started. Eh? So it's that, that exact same greenish film that you have in there. So also with using the right printing strategy, right packaging strategy, you can hide is maybe not the right word, but you can cope maybe with some of the differences that you have and with the expectations that the customers would have when they buy such packaging. Because you don't want basically a, a dirty green on something that you use to clean. Okay, that was not the intention. Um, good. Third product, the OPP, that's what I showed you. It's uh, for cosmetic sachets, so typically what you would use to uh, remove makeup or a lotion or um, a shampoo. OPP is offering, again, that stiffness, heat resistance, transpar transparency, printability. The metallized OPP, metallization typically is used to add high barrier to that. Barrier against lights, oxygen, moisture, and aroma. You don't want to lose aroma inside out, but also outside in, you don't want foreign smells to start interacting with the product. Cast PP, where we have our recycled material, it's offering moisture, sealability, toughness, and mechanical properties. So very much like a polyethylene, but if you want the full PP solution, you need something uh, that's PP to start with. This one is not being made yet. It's in the planning for the end of April. Then the final one, stand-up pouch for liquid fill. Um, actually, this is, uh, should be dry fill. So typically, your laundry taps, your dishwasher taps that you use, um, they are packed in uh, PET-PE. Today, you could also find them in MDO-PE, PE. 
In general, bigger pack formats, you need that toughness if you drop them that it doesn't burst open, which a polypropylene is less uh, equipped with. And we are actually also still making the actual spec, but we took some of the other films and we were able to make it also into a film that contains 85% of the recycled material. This one is exactly the same with a different printing strategy. So just realize that the raw material is one side of the thing, but also the converting knowledge and know-how plays an equally important role on what you are able to do with the raw material. These were made on a Friday afternoon, so they might be better if we do them on a Monday morning. <laughs> Good, and then this one already went around. It's the OPA, it's the OPET OPAPE. So definitely a multi-layer, multi-material structure, a nightmare to recycle, but something that we would be able to deal with in a multi-cycle process. We have the PET, oh, the PET there to uh, print on. It provides the, the window. The OPA is there for burst resistance. If you have a liquid, you don't want it to if you handle it, hold it, you don't want to puncture that. You don't want the liquid to start seeping out. And also there for aroma barrier. Again, you don't want the nice smelling uh, fragrances to go out, lose the potency of, of what you use, as well as having it contaminated. And then the PE, again, for the bulk and the sealability. And there it shows actually that you can take complex packaging material with creosol, turn it in pure streams, and then use it again to make complex multi-material structures. Good, this was more or less everything that we wanted to show. It's really about the output of the process. What are we capable to do? And of course, I'm the one presenting it here today, but this has been very much a collaborative effort in uh, what's called our work package five group. So. Uh, I, I really want to thank also my colleagues, uh, Clemence and Isabel from Amcor sites. I want to thank the Lumi people uh, for running this uh, at high pace for one year without stopping. Uh, Aimplas for the, the support and then also the Fraunhofer colleagues uh, for providing the material, the, the know-how, the support. And it's only because of this collaborative effort that we were able to come to the results that we were able to show to you today. So that's about everything I had to share. and. Uh, I leave the floor now open for questions, I guess. Peter, thank you, yes. <laughs> we do indeed have time for any quick questions, either from the room or from online. There's, there's one online for Peter. Uh, what does recycling ready mean? Recycling ready means that in a um, mature recycling infrastructure, that's structure could be collected, sorted out positively, and recycled back into a material that can be used for a next generation product. Of course, this is always dependent on the recycling infrastructure that you have in place. You can imagine if you go uh, to Sub-Sahara Africa, the situation is quite different than it is here in Europe. From our side, as, as a converter, the one thing we can do directly is making sure that the product is designed for recycling. And then it's the collaboration in the value chain to make sure that we go from design for recycling to effectively recycled. Thank you. Natalia? Okay, there's, there's one more. If you can only use parts of recyclable material, then this would not present a full loop, would it? No, that's very true, but if you look at First of all, if you look at the CFLEX guidelines I showed you earlier this morning, you see that it's very much going towards the simplification of the amount of polymers that you put in the inst uh, as an input stream. Reduce that complexity. Then if you look at the creosol material, you're actually able to recover quite a number of those materials. Still, there will be parts like adhesives, inks that you're not able to recover. And I'm not saying today that we have a perfect solution, but we are going from an industry where 10 years ago, maybe 10% of what was going in was being recycled to a situation where 80, 90% of the packaging is effectively recycled. And then you have maybe still 10% that you need to deal with in other ways. But it's a progressive way forward. It's not a zero to one. 